Hello, good evening. Sorry for the delay. My name is Catherine and I work with SEB Housing and this is the information session for the 79 total affordable rental housing units at the, three, uh, the 305, 305 in Waltham, Massachusetts. So the purpose of this session is to give you a little bit of background information on the available apartments. I'm also going to cover the application, the eligibility and lottery processes and what to expect after the lottery itself. So. If you have any questions during the session, you are encouraged to either type them into the Zoom chat or um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. So this is a live session that's being recorded and it's going to be saved to SEB Housing's YouTube channel. So it will be available there after tonight for anybody who would like to see it that wasn't able to attend. After tonight, if you have any questions for us, um, the best way to get in touch is contacting us by email at info at scbhousing.com or that phone number that's at the bottom of your screen as well. So if you have any issues hearing me or seeing the slides or anything during this session, please let me know. Uh, but just wanted to give you first some background information on who we are. So SCB Housing, we are an off-site affordable housing consulting group. So we've been, we're not the on-site management team at the 305, but we've been hired by the developer um, to market the, these units and conduct this information session, collect and review the application to determine applicants' eligibility. And then eventually we'll be running the lottery for these affordable units as well. So in the initial phases, we are your main point of contact rather than the management team or the leasing office over at the 305. Later on in the process, though, you'd be in touch with that leasing team. So the first step in the process, there are a few of them. The first is to apply for the lottery and be found eligible for the affordable housing program based on the application that you submit. So you'll be in touch with SCB Housing during that first step and we can answer any questions you have on the affordable housing program. We'll process your application and run the lottery. The second step in the process though is to be um, lease screened by the leasing office over at the 305. So that's separate from the screening that you'll be um, having with SCB Housing, and um, it might include credit, uh, rental history check, background checks, that sort of thing. Once you've been lease approved by the management team and you're found lease eligible to rent at this property, you'll then be directed back to SCB Housing, and at that point, we will ask you to provide all of your verification. So pay stubs, that sort of thing to verify your income, and you'll be given about 10 days to get all that information into us. Because remember, when you're first submitting your application, you're just self-reporting what your income is, and we are determining your eligibility for the lottery based off of what you've written down there. So the 305, uh, they have a website. If you haven't seen it already, uh, they don't have a ton of, of information on there yet, but I anticipate that they will add, you know, floor plans and other things to it as time goes on. So it is live305.com. That's their website. And if you haven't already, you can also check out the website listing that we have for this property on our website. So scbhousing.com. If you click on the affordable housing opportunities page on SCB Housing's um, site, and you select I want to rent and then select the 305, you're going to be taken to a page specific to this property. And um, you'll see a downloadable version of the application, the information packet. There'll also be the QR code for you to fill out the JOT form link. Uh, most of you, I think, in this call have already filled out that application. You've gone in JOT form, you've already submitted the application. Uh, that is the quickest way to apply for this lottery rather than printing out the application and, and scanning it in. Um, but you're welcome to do that if you haven't applied and do want to submit a paper application. So after you submitted your application, if you did the online form, you should have received a confirmation that your application had been received. And then if you were approved for the lottery, you should have received an, another email from us uh, at SCB Housing confirming uh, you know, the bedroom size that you applied for and all of that. So we encourage you to get your application in early. It is fairly brief. It's only gonna take a few minutes to complete if you haven't already. You don't need to submit supporting documentation just yet. And applications for this lottery are due 
by July um, 11th. So just about a month away. Um, you don't need to be a resident of Waltham to apply for this lottery. There are going to be several units that have local preference for residents of um, Waltham. And I'll discuss that a little bit later as well. All right, so the 305, it is a new uh, rental community. I have a question. Sure. Uh, we're going to find this application. Yep, so the application uh, is on our website at scbhousing.com. And if you click on um, I want to rent and then select the 305, you'll see a QR code, which is the code or not a QR code, it's the uh, link here that's jotform.com. It says Broadstone 305, that's the former um, name of this property. And you can submit an online application there. There's also a PDF on our website that has the uh, paper application if you'd rather fill it out and send it into us. But um, the online application, we do suggest anybody that is able to fill that out. All right, so the um, the property itself. So this is a 314-unit rental community. It's at 305 Winter Street in Waltham. And through this process, there's going to be 79 total affordable rental units made available to households um, that are under certain income tiers. So there's going to be 59 apartments that are going to be made available to households earning no more than 80% of the area median income. And then 20 additional apartments are going to be made available to households that earn no more than 60% of the area median income in a year. Um, you can see the breakdowns. I'm going to go through this in just a minute on your screen of the unit types, the income tiers, the rent amounts, and all of that. Um, but just keep in mind, this, this um, apartment community is going to be an eight-floor multifamily community. There is going to be a private pool and patio a courtyard, there's going to be work from home spaces, a two floor fitness center, a media lounge, um, they're going to have lots of amenities here. And um, in the units themselves, there are high ceilings, so nine foot ceilings, um, beautiful kitchens, in unit washer and dryers, and um, oversized windows with some views of the surrounding area. There, pets are permitted. I have the info on the, the um, slide here for you. There is a fee each month for cats or dogs, but they are permitted. There's a parking space that's included for residents. And um, I've been told that the affordable units are currently expected to be available for leases in late September, but it's possible that that timeline could shift a bit. And um, I do anticipate that the property is going to be pre-leasing those units. So even if um, you're not able to actually sign a lease until, or for a date until late September, there won't be too much of a delay in the process in terms of starting your lease screening and all of that. So in terms of the breakdown of these units, there's affordable studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom apartments being offered at these two income tiers, the 60% of area median income and 80%. And the breakdown is listed on your screen. It's in the information packet. Uh, just quickly, there's seven total studio units. There are um, two that are at 60% AMI, and the rent for those 60% studio units is $1,592. The rent for the 80% studio units is $2,159. And then there are 26 total one-bedroom units. And the 60% rent for those one bedrooms are $1,696. And the 80% units, for those of you that qualify for those, are going to be $2,302. There's also 36 total two-bedroom units. And the rents for the 60% apartments is, uh, is $2,002. And the rent for the 80% two-bedroom units is $2,730. And then you'll see that there's also eight total three-bedroom apartments with the 60% AMI units going for $2,258 and those 80% of AMI three-bedroom apartments going for $3,099.
One of the two bedroom 80% AMI units has features for persons with mobility impairment. So it is considered to be disabled accessible and um, any applicants who, who are applying for a two bedroom that require the features of that unit will have priority on the waiting list for the accessible apartment. These affordable units were selected um, by the owner and they were approved by Mass Housing as being representative of the units in the building as a whole. So that means they're not the smallest units. You know, these affordable units are not identifiable as being affordable units in any way by someone that's just passing by. They're not all, you know, pushed over into one location of the building or anything like that. And the rents are not um, set in accordance with a applicant's income or financial circumstances. So this isn't a subsidized program. These are just affordable apartments within this community and the rents are set. They are not going to change based on, um, you know, if you have more income one year or less income the next, as long as you qualify for the affordable housing program. Um, before I move on to the eligibility criteria for the affordable housing program, does anyone have any questions about sort of the basic overview that I've already given on um, the application process or the unit. All right, so what's on your screen now is the eligibility requirements for this affordable housing program. So there are four main eligibility requirements for this affordable housing program. The first being that your household will need to qualify within the income, uh, the income parameters that are on your screen. So I'll talk more about this in just a few moments, but basically, for this lottery, for some of the units, your, your total household income would need to be at or below 60% of area median income. And for those 80% of area median income units, your income would need to be below that 80% amount. Um, the second eligibility criteria is households cannot own a home upon move-in. So if you own a home now, it would need to be sold before you uh, would be eligible to lease an apartment at the 305. And then another um, eligibility criteria to keep in mind, so household priority is going to be given based on household composition. So generally that means that larger households are going to have priority for larger units. Um, also keep in mind that one person households for this lottery <laughs> cannot live in two bedroom units. And also two bedroom households can't live in three bedroom units unless a household member has a disability that requires a reasonable accommodation for an extra bedroom. Page seven of the information packet, if you haven't looked at that already, lists more details on uh, household size and type. And then the fourth eligibility criteria, this doesn't come up often, but households can't have financial interest in the development and can't be considered related parties. So if you work for the developer or the management or leasing company, you will not be eligible for this opportunity. Um, and I see a question here. Yep. So if you have a Section 8 voucher, sure. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. But if you have a Section 8 voucher, MRVP voucher, whatever housing, whatever mobile housing voucher will allow you to uh, move around and rent wherever you wherever you choose. Um, yes, they're accepted here. Um, the amount that you pay, of course, will be based on your income because of your housing voucher, not because of the program, the affordable housing program that the, um, that the 305 is, is, um, is under. So, yep, with a voucher, you definitely can apply. You just want to make sure that these rents are not higher than what your payment standard is for your voucher. Um, they hopefully are not. Um, and you should also see on your screen, I'm about to talk about this in a second, but there's minimum income amounts that are uh, set in place for this leasing office. But if you have a mobile housing voucher, you do not need to, you can disregard those um, minimum income amounts because they don't apply to you if you have a mobile housing voucher, since your housing agency will be paying for a portion of your rent. Yep, so you're saying this, this year the three bedroom is 3,400, so that should work. Yep. All right, so um, to circle back to the first eligibility criteria to explain more. So your income um, will be screened by SCB Housing once you have moved on to the 
uh, point in the process where you are submitting your income asset tax documentation. So since these are affordable units, they're being made available to rent at prices that are lower than the identical or very similar units within the building. So the maximum income limits that are on your screen right now are set by household size. So you wanna include everyone in your household who will be living in the unit. Take a look at those now. If you look at the uh, household size of one to be eligible for the 60% of AMI units, your total household income cannot be above $68,520. And to, uh, to be qualified for that 80% um, of AMI units, your total household income as a one person household cannot be above $91,200. So that's how you read that chart to get a sense of which, um, which you might be eligible for. Um, these amounts are listed everywhere. So they're listed on the application. You'll see them on the info packet, on the online application. So you'll be able to review these um, as you're going through the application process. So again, we don't need any supporting documentation at this time when you're applying, but um, you will be provided with a documentation requirements guide once you have applied. So if you apply online and you get that um, response email from us within a week or two that is letting you know, you know, we received your application, you're eligible, or you applied for a two-bedroom unit and so forth there will be a link to this documentation requirements guide. And basically it's just a guide detailing exactly what types of documentation you will need to submit later on in the process. So how many pay stubs, how many bank statements and all of that. Um, so when we do uh, count income for this program, it is counted as a projection of your total gross household income over the next 12 months for all household members. So that includes bonuses and overtime, you know, amounts that you may not be dependent on or may not be guaranteed every year. The only exceptions to the income that we would count or have to count when determining your total household income would be wages of minors. So if you have someone in the household who's earning a wage and they're not yet 18, we won't be counting their wage income. If you have a full-time um, dependent student, so someone maybe who's 20, they're in college, we would only be counting the first $480 of their wages if they're working when we're determining your total household income. But other than that, any, any income coming into your household, you know, income such as, you know, pay stubs, social security payments, um, child support, uh, unemployment benefits, anything like that, it is the gross income amount that we need to count, even though most of us are not taking home the amount that's listed on your paycheck, but that is what the program says. We need to count the gross income. Um, how we calculate your income is not one size fits all. And that's because everyone's income circumstances are unique. So some applicants will have a steady income where they have a weekly salary. It's consistent throughout the year. There are people though who are self-employed, they're working seasonally, and maybe they don't have the same sort of income coming in from week to week. In those types of circumstances, we do anticipate that we'll have to look further back into the past to be able to anticipate your income or project your income for the next 12 months. If you're self-employed specifically, you will need to complete a profit and loss statement for your business and then provide supporting documentation to us. So if you're self-employed, your business expenses are taken into account, but if you're not self-employed, it is always going to be the gross income that we count. What about children with disabilities income? Hold on one second. Yes, so if you have um, you know, SSI payments or Social Security payments coming in, since those aren't wages, it is income that needs to be um, you know, written out on your application and will, it will count towards your total household income. Um, if a child is working, though, that's when the wages don't count. So any other payments coming in do need to be um, identified. So in general, any income that you have been making, we're going to assume that you will continue to make it going forward unless we have some sort of documentation from you know, an employer that you're no longer working with them or you won't be guaranteed bonuses next year, whatever that might be. Um, so when you're filling out your application, if you haven't already, just make sure that you're listing everything down there. Um, you know, we will be asking for taxes as well, so that'll come up on your taxes. So you just wanna make sure you're putting in wages, 
like I said, child support, social security, uh, workman's compensation, if you're receiving it, all of that. So there's no minimum income threshold for this affordable housing program. However, most management teams, including the team at the 305, want to be sure that all tenants can afford the rent regardless of whether or not they're renting a affordable unit or a market rate unit. So you'll see the um, approximate minimum income and asset amount on your screen below the maximum income, <coughs> excuse me, amount. And what that is, is that's basically the equivalent of two and a half times the monthly rent. And um, so your income needs to be between that approximate minimum income amount and the maximum program limits there. So if you're a household of one, you have one person in your household, it's just you applying, and you're applying for a studio, and you have an income of $53,000 per year, you will qualify for a studio um, at 60%. You also qualify for a one bedroom because your income is between um, those 60% amounts, those minimum income amounts and the maximum program amount. Ultimately, it is the leasing office's call as to whether or not your household meets these minimum income requirements because again, they're not programmatic uh, amounts. They are set by the leasing office. You don't need to pay attention to these minimum income amounts if you have a housing voucher, like I said because the agency that issues your voucher will uh, be picking up a portion of your rent. So um, you don't need to worry about the minimum incomes, like I said. You just wanna make sure that the payment standard or the max rents for your housing program will, um, will cover this amount or will accept this amount, the rent amount. Um, if, you're, if your income is slightly below these minimum income amounts here, so maybe you make $46,000 per year and you're looking to rent a studio, you might apply and the, um, the leasing office says, you know, you have some assets as well that you might be able to um, use to be able to pay rent. So you could be qualified if you're close to that um, close enough to that minimum income amount. That's really the only exception. You cannot be above the maximum income limit for the program though. There is no asset limit um, for this rental opportunity. So an applicant might have significant assets, maybe they're retired and um, you would still be eligible to rent or to um, apply for this lottery. And even though we don't have a asset limit, um, we are still going to need to collect bank statements and things like that related to your assets. And that's because sometimes um, assets are generating income, which we do need to add to your total household income. All right. If anyone has questions, any other questions about the eligibility criteria for the affordable housing program or the lottery, go ahead and let me know. I'm going to move on to lottery eligibility um, now. So if you've already applied, um, or if you haven't already applied, we encourage you to do so, get the process started. Um, you can apply for more than one unit type. So if you applied for, uh, if you're interested in applying for both a studio and a one bedroom, by all means, you can do that. There's really no downside to doing so. There is a potential downside if you only apply to a one bedroom, for example, and then you decide that you would consider a studio. And that's because maybe the wait list for a studio uh, is going to be pretty long and you're going to be at the end of that wait list if you want to um, apply for it after the lottery is run. So if you've already submitted your application and you want to apply for more than one unit type, you can email us and let us know that you want to make that change before the lottery application date uh, passes. So once you apply, we're going to review your lottery application. We'll contact you if there's any information missing, if anything looks incorrect. Um, if you're found to be eligible for the lottery, you'll be sent an email with your lottery application number. And that's going to come in the form of a dot, a series of numbers. So that is just an anonymous identifier. It's not a ranking of any sort. It's just because we don't want to call your name uh, when we do the lottery. It's going to be just this number that identifies your household. Um, 
and it just corresponds to the order in which your application was received and approved. So if you were the very first person to submit a complete application for the 305, your number is going to be A.001. When you receive this email from us confirming your eligibility for the lottery, uh, it's going to also confirm whether or not your household applied for local preference. So if you've self-reported on your application that you believe your household qualifies for local preference because maybe you live in Waltham or you work full time within the city, um, it will, will let you know that you that you did that. You don't need to submit verification for it until after the lottery. You want to make sure though that you're filling that out correctly. If it if your email shows that you indicated that you have local preference and you know that you don't, you don't live in Waltham, make sure that you update that for us because um, if you're at the top of one of these waiting lists and you're not, and you're not able to confirm your um, local preference after the lottery, you will lose your spot on the waiting list. Um, and as I said, some of these affordable units at the 305 have local preference, some of them do not. The ones that do, that just means that local preference households will get priority for those units over households who don't have local preference uh, that are the same size. The email is also going to confirm the bedroom sizes you've applied for and whether or not you need that disabled accessible unit. Um, and then the documentation requirements guide will be listed as well in the uh, email you receive. So you're able to hopefully gather some of that information so you'll have it ready if you are called forward to, um, to move on in the process after the waiting lists are established. If you're found ineligible for the lottery at any time, maybe you're considered to be over income, you'll be informed. We do encourage you to contact us with any questions. If maybe there was a mistake on your application, we can make that change for you. So don't hesitate to email us if you see that. You will have also indicated your household type, so one, two, or three. In some cases, smaller households are can apply for larger units, but in general, larger households are going to have priority over smaller households. Um, I mentioned before that, um, you know, you, a type one household can apply for, or sorry, in this in this case, a one person household, unless you have a um, unless you have a disability that requires an extra bedroom, you would not be eligible for a two bedroom unit, for example. Yep, so question here, did you say we're able to apply for more than one type of apartment? Yep, if, you're, if your family is interested in both, say a studio and a one bedroom, you can apply for both. If you're interested in both a two and a three bedroom, go for it. Um, yep, you can do that. If you've, and again, if you've already applied and um, you only applied for one of those um, types, we can add um, your name to the other uh, unit type if you just email us at info at scbhousing.com and we can correct that for you before the application deadline. So the lottery itself is going to be held on July 29th at 6 p.m. Same format as this in terms of it being a Zoom, Zoom meeting. Um, and given the large number of applicants that we're expecting for this lottery, it's going to be held digitally, meaning that the lottery numbers are going to be randomized on the screen. It's going to be a screen share, and you'll be able to see the results of the lottery uh, by screen share. So every lottery number will be included or drawn during that lottery. Sometimes when we think of lotteries, we just think, you know, there's 79 units, there's going to be 79 winners of the, of the lottery. That's not the way that these lotteries work, though. The purpose of them is just to establish an order of priority for the waiting list. So in general, sure, it is um, more beneficial if your number is called earlier in the lottery, but it's not necessarily the deciding factor on whether or not you're going to be at the top of one of these waiting lists. Um, so for example, if a qualified type one household is drawn first in the lottery, and they've applied for a unit that someone else has priority over them for. So maybe it's someone who requires a disabled accessible unit or, um, you know, someone who has a larger household type. They're not going to be the first person on the waiting list in that case. So um, if your number is drawn later in the lottery, don't lose hope. That doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to move forward in this process. It just means that um, we're going to sort the, the results from the lottery and um, we will populate the waiting list taking local preference into consideration and whether or not your household requires a disabled accessible unit. 
And we do our best to send the waiting list to you the evening or later on that night of the lottery. So while if you're sitting in the lottery and you're kind of like, I don't really know where I am on these waiting lists, that's because the lottery doesn't tell you a whole lot. It's the waiting list that we populate after the lottery that um, is an indication as to, you know, where you fall on the waiting list is going to be your indication as to whether or not you're moving forward in the process. So you should have that information the night of the lottery, but attending the lottery may not tell you a whole lot. Um, okay, after the lottery, there's just a question here. After the lottery, will the rest, rest of the names not chosen be put on a waiting list for next month? So, yes. So the waiting lists that are established will feature only the lottery applications. So anyone who applied during this waitlist period that goes through July 11th will be on a waiting list, maybe more than one waiting list, depending on whether or not you apply for more than one unit size. Um, and, you know, typically if there's 79 units to be filled, there's going to be quite a few people on each waiting list. And, um, you know, there's quite a few units available as well. So um, you could be way down a waiting list and not get one of these units, not be able to move forward in the process, or it could take several weeks or maybe even a couple of months for the leasing office and SCB housing to get through everyone ahead of you on a waiting list and determine whether or not they're eligible for the program. So, um, you will remain on the waiting list indefinitely each year. These, um, the leasing office will reach out to everyone on their waiting list to confirm if you would like to remain on the waiting list in case there's future vacancies. So if you're not one of the people or the households who has uh, leased initially in one of these new units, if someone moves out, they would be going down their waiting list to fill the affordable units um, or to lease the affordable units with applicants who uh, qualify for them, because these units will always be affordable. Um, it's not just this initial lease up that is leased to households that qualify for this program. It's indefinite. Um, okay, so when you review that email that is sent to you the night of the lottery with the waiting list, you're going to find your lottery application number on the waiting list. So You'll have a better idea at that point as to whether or not you'll be moving on to the next step in the process, which is to do your lease eligibility screening with the leasing office. So following the lottery, we connect the top households from each waiting list with the management team. Your contact information will be provided to them as well, and you'll be able to uh, connect and fill out their lease application screening within about five days or so from the lottery. As a reminder, SCB Housing, we're going to be screening your application for the lottery and then also at the end of this process for your program eligibility, but we don't screen your household for lease eligibility. That's the management company that's going to be doing that. So again, this, this would be the check that maybe you've had before. Um, if you've rented with a management company, they may be doing rental history check, credit check, background check to determine if you're eligible to rent with them. And be aware that the leasing office may invite more households to complete a lease screening than there are available units. For example, at the 305, there are eight total affordable three-bedroom units, but it's likely that 16 or more households could be invited from the waiting list to complete that lease screening. And this is typical, so management companies do this because often there is, in the process of leasing units, they're slowed down by households who don't qualify, who decide that they no longer are interested, and all of that. So we want to move the process along by giving um, a few more applicants the opportunity to submit their information. So immediately following the lottery, you're, if you see that you're the first household on the waiting list, you still don't want to give notice to your current landlord if you're, if you're renting somewhere um, because you haven't been lease approved with the management company, and then also you haven't submitted any of your income information to SEB Housing, and we still need to do that review to confirm your eligibility for the affordable housing program. But once you are lease approved by the leasing office, that's the point in the process where having a position near the top of the waiting list is beneficial to you, because if you're that top person on one of the waiting lists, you're going to have the first chance to reserve an affordable apartment. So if you're the top position on 
the two-bedroom waiting list. You're going to have the first choice of reserving one of those affordable two-bedroom units. So you could, you know, choose a unit on a floor that you're interested in or uh, one that just has features that you're looking for. And that's true even if households behind you on the waiting list fill out all their paperwork before you do. You're still, the waiting list um, order still needs to be followed by the leasing office. So nobody behind, if you're first on the list, nobody behind you can skip ahead of you, even if it's taking you a couple of extra days to get your information into us or to the leasing office. How often, just another question here, how often will the rent go up for affordable units or will it stay affordable? So um, rent increases typically happen once per year. Usually they're pretty modest. Um, you know, this is all just a recalculation of the area median income that comes out every year. Um, HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Department, the Federal Housing and Urban Development Department, releases the area median incomes for every geographic location every year. And as I'm sure most of you know, the Boston area median incomes have been rising steadily um, over the past several years. So the rents typically do go up. Um, they're still under the formula for this affordable housing program. They're all always still considered affordable but that um, they're quite high because of, as you can see from just what the rents are at these affordable apartments, they're still not, um, not cheap. So anyway, the, the rent amounts uh, can increase, likely will increase each year. But again, it's usually modest. You would always, it would never increase uh, within your first year of the lease. The rents that were in the information packet and that have been advertised for this lottery will be the rents for the first year. And then um, if they're going to change, you will have several months notice ahead of a lease renewal, uh, letting you know what the new amount would be. So again, once per year, but the rents will never change within a lease term. So once you've reserved a affordable unit with the leasing office, the leasing office is gonna notify us at, at SCB Housing, and we're then going to contact you to coordinate the submission for your verifying documents. So your income, asset, and tax documentation will then be required to be submitted to SEB Housing. So we can do your final program eligibility review. Hopefully at this point, you've taken a look at the documentation requirements guide that we sent to you. And, um, and that would have come to you as a link in your email when we determined your eligibility for the lottery. And hopefully you've started to gather some of that documentation. You have your pay stubs ready. You'll have about 10 days to get that information into us. And um, we will work with you throughout that process. There's a lot of information that needs to come in. So, um, you know, no worries at all. If you don't have all of the information on your first try, we will make sure, again, to work with you and make sure you get that full file into us. Once we have approved your information, your file, we will notify you. and um, then you'll be able to get in touch with the leasing office again and establish a move-in date for the unit that you have reserved after your lease eligibility um, screening was done. For how long are the contract uh, contracts once people are eligible? So I'm not sure what you mean by that. Did you mean um, how long is the lease term? If it's the lease term, it's one year. Um, you're found eligible and the certification that SEB Housing gives to you is good for six months. So say today you are found, well, this would, say in August, you are approved by SEB Housing. We've done your income certifications, all of that. Your certification is good for six months. If you move in at some point within that six month period, you're all set, you don't need to do any other screenings with us. If for some reason you don't move in until after six months is up, you will need to be rescreened. Um, if I didn't answer your question, let me know. But once you're leased, um, you're done with screening until your lease renewal date. So several months ahead of the lease renewal date, the leasing office will let you know that you need to recertify your income. We hope that you've loved living at the 305 and you want to continue living there beyond the first year of your lease. If you do, you just need to complete that recertification with the leasing office. If your income has increased and is now above either the 60% or 80% of AMI amounts, that's fine. 
households remain eligible for the affordable housing unit as long as the household income doesn't increase beyond 140% of the area median income. So the information packet lists those 140% figures. <clears throat> but to give you an idea, um, trying to get to the right thing here. Um, to give you an idea, if you are a two-person household and you qualify for a 60% AMI unit for this lottery, you would have qualified having an income at or below $68,500. That same family can make up to $95,928 next year at the time of the recertification and it would still be eligible for that 60% unit. So there's a little bit of wiggle room there. If you have a raise or anything like that, it doesn't mean that you're going to lose your affordable housing apartment. Um, another question here. So, so basically every year you have to provide all the paperwork you did the first time to be qualified um, or just provide pay stubs. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's an application. Again, it's not as involved as it, it was to get into the lottery, but um, with the leasing office, it's a recertification application, it's a few pages long, and then you submit pay stubs and just verification of your income and taxes each year. Um, so it is a recertification process. It's not as uh, it's not as involved as what the process is that you'll be going through to um, initially rent one of the units. Up. And uh, you know, any anyone who is um, renting an affordable apartment, we always just kind of suggest that you have a folder set aside with you know your current tax returns, pay stubs, that sort of thing, so you have it at the ready when recertification does come around. Because uh, the leasing office will be looking for that a few months in advance. So that really covers what I wanted to get through in the, the from the information packet and just the process um, from here to the lottery and then a little bit beyond the lottery. Um, let me know if there's any other questions. And we also just um, yep. Can I show the previous screen? Yep. Here. Yep. So to get in touch with the leasing, yeah, five days. So um, after the lottery, you're going to want to get in touch with the leasing office to complete your lease application. Is there a deposit or security deposit needed? Let me, there usually is. So um, I just want to check about the, if I have these specific. I may have, no, I don't have it here. Oh, yeah, security deposit. Yep, so it's going to be security deposit, and the amount of that security deposit may not be up to the full uh, contract rent amount. It's based on your lease screening, according to the um, leasing office, and um, your first month's rent, and that's prorated if you move in on a day that is not the first of the month. So it sounds like they will not be asking for last month's rent. It would just be security deposit and first month's rent, which makes sense. The last month's rent, if you stay there for several years, may not be the same amount as it is when you move in. Uh, from what days are you guys expecting people can start to move into the apartment? So for right now, the leasing office said that in late, uh, they're looking at getting a permit to be able to start leases for the end of September. That amount is still, and that, uh, Timeline is still a little bit up in the air, but that is the current estimate it would be late September. I don't believe that means that they're not going to be screening anyone before then. So you will be able to move forward in this process after the lottery and um, not have too much of a delay because they would be pre-leasing the units, meaning that you could lease the unit before you were able to actually move in. So um, that is the timeline for right now, late, late September for first units. Any other questions? If you haven't applied already, um, online application is the easiest way to do so. You'll see the um, drop form link on your screen now, but you also will find it on our website. And um, there's a QR code on the website as well if you're if you're um, if you want to use that. So we encourage you to apply. July 11th is the last date to get your application in. The online, uh, I should mention too, the online application form will shut down at 2 p.m. on July 11th. So um, make sure if you're 
leaving it to the last minute, um, don't be surprised when you're not able to apply or log in after 2 p.m. because it will shut down at that point. All right, if there's no other questions. Can I have one more question? Sure, yep. Um, how do you know if you've applied? Um, is so it you if you got your lottery number? So the first thing, the if you applied online, you'll get an instantaneous response saying we received your application. Then in about a week or two, once um, SCB Housing has reviewed your application, um, you'll get another email with more specific information in terms of just confirmation of the bedroom sizes that you applied for and um, you know more details. It'll have an address for your name. It'll be a different kind of formal email. But as long as you receive that instantaneous um, confirmation after you submitted an online application, you should be all set. Yep, someone's asking here if you have an A.0, yep, you're all set. Yep, you already have a lottery application number, then that means you are in the lottery. You've already been approved. Any other questions before I let you go? All right, thank you everyone for, for joining. And if you have any questions, um, please, any questions that you didn't think of tonight, please email us at info at scbhousing.com. Um, we're here to help and uh, we look forward to getting your application. Have a good night.